morning. Uh, we f- will find the Word of God in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7 is the passage for this morning. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Let's read responsively from the English Standard Version. Revelation chapter 2. Now read verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who are themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from whom, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this I have. You hate the works of the uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let's read together. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. This is the word of God. Thanks to your prayers and to uh, your supports, uh, I, will, I and my wife were able to uh, attend this year's uh, Southern Baptist Convention, uh, hosted in Birmingham, Alabama. Has anybody been to Birmingham, Alabama? I didn't think so. <laughs> it's a very, uh, you know, backward, um, very quiet, peaceful place. And we wouldn't have visited without, were it not for the convention. Well, as uh, may, maybe you've heard before, there are 47,000 Baptist, Southern Baptist churches in the U.S., which makes it the largest Protestant denomination in the world. And uh, this year, 12,000 people gathered at the uh, Jefferson uh, Birmingham Convention Center to, to celebrate what the Lord has done uh, through the past year. And uh, with the Korean side, uh, there, there was a Korean convention as well alongside the larger, the bigger convention. Uh, there were 600 messengers in attendance, and I and my wife uh, were representative of, Korea, uh, of uh, the Cornerstone Church and also representing Cornerstone Church to the Greater Convention. We were at both places uh, last uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And it was a great uh, celebration as we heard the reports of what God has been doing in the mission field and what God has been doing in North America and uh, the great reports that are found in the churches all over the United States. It was a great privilege to be uh, part of that, uh, that gathering. Whenever I visit, me and my wife visit the convention, we feel like we are you know, uh, small lights. You know, we are all scattered you know, all over the U.S., and the messengers, as they all come together, the light becomes greater and bigger and brighter. And we celebrate uh, the goodness of God each year together as messengers for the uh, Church of Christ. Uh, one of the things that happens during the convention is, you know, we get to hear a lot of stories of churches. And uh, it gives me time to reflect upon Cornerstone Church and do a review of our ministry, our health. You know, uh, I know most of you do a health checkup, uh, at least a, a blood test, I hope, every year to see how your health is, your status is. And it's a way to consistently uh, avoid uh, dangerous, you know, uh, conditions that might occur in our, in our bodies. And so we do an annual checkup. Like, like so, I believe the convention provides an opportunity for our church and churches to review ourselves, see where we are at, health uh, spiritually, or our spiritual health is, and uh, it gives us a time to reflect upon uh, our ministry. Through today's word, I hope to um, do a spiritual review upon our church, our convention, and also our, our, pers- our individual lives, spiritual lives. This, therefore, we would not just dwell in things that we are so comfortable in, but try to seek and, and, and uh, reflect upon how Jesus wants his church 
to be, what the standard is, and where we stand according to his standards. And we, so we look at the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and uh, we're not going to look at chapter 3, but chapter 2 and 3 talk about the churches that Jesus evaluates, and reviews, and he assesses. The today's message is, what must the church of Christ remember? What should the church of Jesus Christ remember? That is the question uh, we want to raise this morning and answer in our hearts. Uh, and the, the text that we read this morning from the church of Ephesus gives us three answers to three things we need to remember about the church of Jesus. The first is this, that Jesus is present in his church. Can we say it together? Jesus is present in his church. Uh, verse two, um, chapter 2 of verse 1 talks about one specific church, and we want to focus on this church, the church in Ephesus. Um, as you might know, the uh, book of Revelation was written by John, the last disciple of Jesus. Around the time of AD 95, 96, uh, he was the last surviving apostle of Jesus. And you can imagine, it's been about 40 years since the church in Ephesus was planted, right? We remember Paul, the apostle, he planted, he, he taught in the hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus uh, back in AD 51, 52, around that time for three years. We can picture him lecturing verse by verse the Old Testament, how it reflects, it, uh, reconnects, it connects to Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel, and as a result of his ministry, a church sprang up, and that is the church of Ephesus. Well, uh, time has passed, and John, he is, again, elderly person. He's at the end of his life, and he receives this revelation from Jesus Christ after all these years. And we get a glimpse of how Jesus saw his churches, especially the seven churches of uh, uh, Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and Ephesus. The church of Ephesus was one of those seven prominent churches. So let's look at Jesus' assessment of uh, how he sees his, he saw his important church in Ephesus. Verse 1 says this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Are there angels in the church? Is there an angel sitting beside you? Maybe. Uh, the, the word angel literally means messenger, right? One sent. So, um, Paul, uh, what's his name? John is speaking to the messenger. Actually, Jesus Christ, who is uh, behind the words of John, he is speaking to the messenger of the church to Ephesus. In other words, he's speaking to the spiritual leader of the congregation. He's speaking to the pastor. He's addressing the pastor so that this message could be spread among the church members in Ephesus. And we can get a glimpse of how Jesus sees this church. Let's go back to the, the scripture here. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. If you look at the previous paragraph in chapter 1, the sort of like introduction to this chapter 2 and 3, uh, we see Jesus holding seven stars. And these stars are the exact angels that uh, was mentioned a while ago, the messenger. In other words, Jesus is holding the leaders of the churches uh, that are planted in his name. He is holding them in his right hand. What does it mean to hold in the hand? Do you hold hands with a stranger? Do you hold hand with a person who's at the bus stop and you just hold hands and, you know. Holding hands is a way of intimacy. It's a, a relationship that you have with that person. Holding hands can mean two things. One is to control, right? As if you're a mom controlling your child, leading the child. It can also mean support, to elevate, to encourage. It has that dual meaning, to hold hand. And Jesus was holding the seven stars in his hand. He's holding his messenger, his angel. He's holding his seven churches in his hands. And not only is he holding these uh, stars and his church, but it says, he who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Uh, and we know the analogy, the symbolism here. Lampstands are the churches, the seven churches across uh, Asia Minor. And it says Jesus is walking among these lampstands. 
He is with them. He is present with them. That is the, the way uh, it's written here. And uh, what does it mean that Jesus is present is with them? It means that he is watching. That he knows. He sees. He understands. Uh, look with me if you have your Bibles to the 14th verse of chapter 1. How John sees Jesus, what he looks like, right? He's very different from what we think we, we know of him, right? Verse 14 of chapter 1 goes like this. The hairs of his head, Jesus' head, were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, it says. We remember Jesus in, in the pictures, in the drawings, the portrait of this graceful and, and gracious shepherd who's holding a, a, a little sheep, wee sheep, tending and caring for them with maybe rough hands of a carpenter, right? But this Jesus that John saw in AD 95 was a very different uh, composure. He had this glorious face. It was so white. It was really hard to see his, his face. And uh, his eyes it says, was like bla uh, blazing fire. Fire was coming out of his, uh, his, uh, his eyes. It was such a sight to see. And we find John worshiping this Jesus. Uh, imagine this Jesus walking among, who sees with his fiery eyes all things, all present, almighty God, walking among his church. He knows and sees, he understands. In fact, he is with us here as we worship the Lord together as a church. He is at the fellowship table when we have lunch, when we converse and have fellowship. He is in our classrooms as our Sunday school teachers teach the lesson, as the kids gather. He is in the youth sanctuary as the gospel is preached. He is in our small group gathering when the word is shared and we are encouraging one another in prayer. He is omnipresent and omniscient. He, can do, he is everywhere and he, he can do all things. And that is expressed in the word that he walks among the seven lampstands among his churches. I, as a pastor, also, you know, from time to time, after lunch or during lunch, try to wander around and walk around a little bit to see if everything is okay, if there is anybody that needs prayer, if there is anybody that uh, is uh, in, in danger, and who is in, of, of need, and who needs care, who are by themselves. It is the heart of the shepherd. If uh, I, as a pastor, do that, how much more Jesus, who sees all things and knows all things, is omnipresent, and he is uh, truly caring for his church. Jesus, yes, he is present in his church. The one thing that John wants us to remember, the first point is that Jesus is present. He is there in his church. You know, the last part of my trip was a visit to Atlanta. And uh, Atlanta has, is famous for many things, right? There's the CNN um, you know, studios and the Coca-Cola Museum. But I don't know if you know this, there, the headquarters of Chick-fil-A is in Atlanta. You know, have you been to Chick-fil-A? Anybody? Come on, yes, the restaurant, not the movie theater. There's no, <laughs> there's a Christian, you know, corporate, you know, uh, fast food chain, and it's uh, number three of the U.S. all fast foods after McDonald's and Starbucks. Can you imagine? They close on Sunday, so some of you who always have time only on Sunday have never visited Chick-fil-A. Anyway, so uh, the uh, the founder, Troy Cathy, Mr. Cathy, passed away last year, I believe. And uh, we were able to visit the corporate office, and we were able to visit his office. Uh, they still had it on display, and you could even, you know, have a, take a picture at his desk. I wish we had the thing. I promise I have <laughs> on the computer, but oh well, just imagine. Or you could look in the back, maybe. Um, can you show us in the back, actually? No, that's the convention. Um, yeah, just turn around, and could you show us the next, uh, no, that's the convention. 12,000 people gathered there. Um, Mr. Truitt's office. Come on, a couple of, yeah, there, no, before that, right there, yeah. So uh, that's this chair. Um, obviously, it's not Mr. Truitt. <laughs> so eat more chicken, uh, so cow. But uh, on his desk, I was impressed to see a, a Bible there, open to Proverbs 22, verse 1, saying, Desire uh, wisdom above wealth and riches. And as a businessman, that spoke volumes to him throughout his life. But I was not just impressed by the Bible, that his very own Bible was open there, but at the little picture frame, uh, that little picture on the 
right of his or yeah, right of his desk. If you're sitting, can you show us the next slide? Actually, it's magnified. Can you show us the next slide? Yes. So we see a business deal. You know, he's making a deal with another um, you know partner, I guess. And Tritt always said that uh, the best deal is when both parties walk away feeling good. When both parties are, are gaining something from this deal, that, must be the, that, that is the deal that he pursued throughout his life. And for that to be possible, he always reminded himself that Jesus was present in all the dealings. He should be present in all the dealings of Chick-fil-A. And uh, through his ministry, he called it a ministry, a glorifying God ministry, and influencing, positive influence of the community. Uh, this Chick-fil-A corporation has grew, grown so much uh, big as today. If a, a CEO of a company realized that his God's, Jesus' presence is with his company, how much more is Jesus with his church, his bride? Of course he's here with burning, flaming eyes, watching and understanding. What does this mean for us? If, as we remember that Jesus is among our church, we can remember that we can rely upon him as he understands our struggles in our hearts. As we have a conflict maybe in our relationship in the church, we can always seek Jesus' help. Instead of complaining to somebody about our church relationship or difficulty in the church, we can pray like this, Lord Jesus, please see us. Please behold the situation. Jesus, I know you're here. I know you've seen our conversation. I know the, you know, understand the struggle that's within my heart. Jesus, this is your church. You are all seeing and you are all knowing of your church. Would you take care and save us and protect us from this evil? We have the right to pray to Jesus through that prayer. As we remember and as we realize the presence of Jesus in his church. And that's what verse 1 is, is uh, visualizing for us of how Jesus is among us and he is in us. Number two, what is the thing that Jesus wants us to remember about his church? Number two is this, Jesus praises his church. Any church, if it's the church of Jesus, Jesus praises his church. He cheers it on. Verse two, Jesus praises the church in Ephesus. He says, I know your works. All seeing Jesus with his flaming eyes, fiery eyes, he knows. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who have called themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. Wow, this is such a, a big praise from Jesus. It goes on, similar tone. Verse 3, I know you uh, are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. Imagine, how, how old is this church again? Uh, 50s and now it's 90s, so about 40 years. It's a matured, a seasoned church, 40-year church. We're about 17 years old. This church was 40 years old. So they have been good at what they've been doing. And they've been faithful all these years. Don't think, oh, it's just years go by and you age another year, annual, annual celebration. This was a church in Rome, right? This was a church constantly under, under the beating of the Roman officials and by Caesar himself. All the disciples were persecuted and they were executed. Uh, and the Christians, if you identify as a Christian, you are ridiculed and you are you have, you're disadvantaged. You are uh, looked down upon by society. And for this church to survive 40 years and to receive this praise from Jesus that, well done, all this time you have kept up the good work, you have endured the race, and you are still faithful to me, and not only that, you have been so into the Word of God that you understand what is false and what is true. You were able to discern the false sects, the cults around there, and you have been faithful to me. And he also names, Jesus names a specific cult in verse 6. Uh, as we read, he says, uh, you have, the church have, you have hated the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, who I also hate. We don't know much about the Nicolaitans, but we know they were a, a form a, of Gnosticism, which means that the, the spirit is good, the bod, body is evil, which is not true. Uh, and uh, so whatever you do in the spirit is okay. If you, can, if you sin with your body, that's okay. So they have this false, weird teaching about Christianity. And 
the church in Ephesus, you were able to, to reject them, know them for who they are, the false teachers they are. And I agree with you. Jesus is saying, I agree with you. I affirm your decision. What a praise that this church received from Jesus. Whenever I read about the church in Ephesus, I, it reminds me of Cornerstone Church, in fact. This church in Ephesus was founded by Paul, but it received many great teachings by famous pastors and preachers. After Paul, there was Apollos, who was a, a scholar in the Old Testament studies. He preached uh, about Jesus. And also there was Priscilla and Aquila, who were laymen, who were really versed in the scripture and knew about Jesus Christ. And so this tradition of Bible exposition and teaching and Sunday school probably even in the Tall of Tyrannus went on. And over 40 years, they kept up this teaching of the word of God. They knew by heart the word of God and they were living out what God had wanted them to live, how, they wanted, how God wanted them to live. And so as a result, Jesus is praising them lavishingly with his heartfelt praise and his uh, gratitude even probably. And so we see Jesus praising his church. And as I see my church, our Cornerstone Church, we are also people who love to, to uh, study the Word of God together. I know if it's for 52 weeks of the year, except for those lunch-serving Sundays, there are always, you know, some of you uh, studying the Word of God and trying to explain the meaning and applying that word to uh, each other and praying and supporting each other. If Jesus were to see that, and he does see it, how, much, how, how glad, how rejoicing he would be to see his word being planted in the people's hearts. I see uh, many Bible studies always going on. Sunday schools every Sunday without fault. Our children and youth, they're always being uh, seated with the Word of God. Through Vibration Bible School, through our revival retreats, all these events, the Word of God is, is preached. And to, uh, to my knowledge, I don't know if, I don't think there was ever a cult that came into our church. They dare not, dare not come because we have such great teachers of the Word of God. He can discern the Word of God. And I see, as I see our church, I believe Jesus would also praise us for the faithfulness, praise you for the faithful ministry, endurance of love and of, of correct Bible teaching. In fact, not only our church, uh, we, we can pride ourselves in the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist Church is 47,000 churches who are strong in the Word of God. There is even a publisher, Lifeway Publishing, uh, who is dedicated to developing the curriculum and the Word of God for all ages. There's also the Women Missionary Union, WMU, which we visited in Birmingham this past week, the headquarters there. And uh, we see how mission education is done in all the Baptist churches. Also, the International Mission Board, North American Mission Board, and the Baptists are really about the Word of God. Sunday school is, is a trademark for Southern Baptist people. And we can see how God is blessing the churches, Southern Baptist churches, and we see here of the great work of God each year when so many others are struggling. Uh, young people are leaving the church. And I believe as Jesus sees our church and our denomination, he would be pleased. And he would probably say something similar uh, to us as he said to his church in Ephesus. Brothers and sisters, let us continue on the praiseworthy work of Jesus, which is to be faithful in teaching and learning, applying the word of God, which we are known for. And as we do, we pray, I pray that we would be a church of one book. And I pray that every one of you, brother and sister, you would be a Christian of one book, always following the, the word of Jesus and not only following but also obeying and living it out so that you will be praiseworthy, continuously be praiseworthy church uh, by Jesus Christ. We must remember that Jesus praises and encourages us. We're so used to always, you know, uh, repenting and being rebuked that we don't think about that way. But Jesus really is happy, is joyful for the things, a uh, ministry, endurance that you uh, are contributing to the kingdom of God. There's a third remembering that Jesus shows us in the scripture. The first, we must remember that Jesus is with this church. Second, we must remember that Jesus praises his church. And third, 
as you've expected, Jesus rebukes and restores his church. And he wants us to see this as he's written the scripture for us. Verse 4, there is this contrast, right? A change of, a shift in tone. It says, but I have this against you. I am not happy with this uh, in you, he's saying. And what is that one thing that Jesus has against this church in Ephesus? It says that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Jesus is not saying, you know, now you've been doing a good job, let's enhance it by upgrading something. He does not say this. He says, you have fallen away from something in the past. You used to be good at it, but you have fallen away. Let's see what that is in verse 5. He says, um, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And the consequence, if not, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from, your, from its place unless you repent. A very serious warning by Jesus. What is this thing, first thing that the Ephesian Christians have fallen away from? You know, as we've said, as we've seen, this church in Ephesus was really good at teaching the Bible, really good at and passionate about living out the word of God. But Jesus is saying, in reality, you have fallen away from my will. I want you to think about that. You have understanding of the Word of God, and you have this passion and commitment, even sacrificing your life for this cause, but you have fallen away from my will. Before, you know, when you were first in love with me, your passion was me. You looked at my face. You heard my voice. You followed my passion, my vision. And so that's why you studied the Word, and you lectured, and you heard and learned. But over the years, 20, 30, 40 years, you are good at what you've been doing. You are good at what you are accustomed to, what you uh, are comfortable for you. But you no longer hear my voice. You no longer know my heart. You have fallen away from the first love, the first things that you are in love with. Again, it's been 40 years now. And despite their efforts, the best effort, despite their knowing, they, their heart had turned cold and hardened. And Jesus was, he saw this reality. You know, our churches, we church, us, you and I too, we do not want to be diagnosed. We don't want to be tested. Do you like going to the hospital and uh, getting tested by a doctor? Dr. Chun is here. <laughs> you know, we don't, it's not a most pleasant experience because uh, you're kind of afraid, what if you know, something is wrong and I need to change something? It's not a comfortable experience, but it's a necessary experience. We, by nature, human nature, we want to dwell in what we're good at, what we're comfortable with. We're very conservative, conservative people. We might be saying like, such, such things. You know, our church is really passionate for worship. Uh, my church is really like a family church. It's like a family. You might be saying, oh, our church is really good at Bible study. Our church is number one. We are our, we're a champion church in evangelism and missions. But when we say those things, the other flip side is, you know, because we're so good at all these things, we're professional and we know, we, know, we have the know-how in these things because we are like that. We comfort ourselves and we think that we must be in God's will that uh, God approves us, us and, and we, there's nothing wrong with us but we cannot deceive the all seeing eyes of Jesus Christ we might be doing the things that we think is the Lord but, but over time it becomes complacent we're doing so, such things because we're comfortable with those things we don't want to do other things that Jesus tells us to do. We're, now our hearts are not as fresh and, 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 and soft as before to be receptive of direction from the Lord. And we console ourselves by saying, we are good at worshiping. We are good at praise. We are good at praying. We are good at um, missions and evangelism. 
But maybe our hearts become hardened to hear freshly what the Lord is saying to us. That was the case for the church in Ephesus. Although they were Bible teachers, they were living out faithfully in the persecution, you do not have a relationship with that freshness is gone. It's not there anymore that you used to have repent, remember the first things with me and, and repent. And if you do not, the stern warning was, stern warning was, I will take out, I will extinguish the flame of your lamp. In other words, I will disperse your church. You know, the church of Jesus Christ will always be victorious, but Jesus says, if you are not functioning as my church, if you're not listening to the voice of the shepherd, I have to make some changes. This was a very serious warning to the beloved church of Ephesus. I believe uh, the Southern Baptist Convention this year was a time of assessment, of review as a convention. There are many issues in the convention, but one of the, the facts, the ugly face of uh, the convention uh, surfaced from last year, in fact. Uh, you know, there were many you know, um, sexual misconduct in the spiritual leadership. Some of the big, well-known names of the uh, convention, they were, uh, we find that they were involved in the sexual abuse. And I believe this year, uh, a newspaper, Houston Chronicle, has published uh, over 200 sex offenders within the church, Baptist churches, pastors, and leaders. And this was a shocking revelation to, to many. And so there was this need and an outcry to do something about the, the morality of, of the leadership in the convention. And so the, uh, Dr. Greer, who is the president this year for the convention, he, uh, he, but led by him, the Southern Baptists made a resolution. They, uh, they proposed a, 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 a bill and, and they, uh, they uh, actually passed it. It was saying, the bill is this, that if there are any Baptist churches that are in fellowship in the convention and they find that there is a sexual misconduct and it is not properly dealt with, the consequences are not there and it's not properly dealt with, the convention will cut the fellowship with that church. And it's written in the bylaws uh, as of last week. And, and that was an effort to protect the rights uh, protect the women and the minority of the church. And this was uh, a very embarrassing uh, moment for the convention, but something that Jesus had surfaced up for the churches of North America, of, of Southern Baptist churches. And so I applaud the leadership of the convention, their brave act to, to go make this decision and even go further from this point to protect the churches of God. Are there things in our church that Jesus might see and rebuke? Are there aspects in your life that Jesus might not be happy with and is in fact against you? Jesus who sees all things with the fiery eyes, who holds his church, who is omnipresent in all of our, our, our gatherings and our, in our hearts. Is there anything that Jesus would be displeased with and even against he, and he might say the same warning to us. If you do not correct this, if you do not go back to hearing and seeing my voice, hearing me and, and seeing me, I will remove your church, your lampstand from where it is. I will remove your fellowship, your closeness with God. Are there things in our lives that Holy Spirit speaks to us? I want to read the last verse of uh, this, uh, the paragraph we read. In verse 7, uh, the reward is to who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the light, tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. But when we are once again softened in our hearts and we hear the voice of Holy Spirit who reminds us of the teaching of Jesus, as we freshly see the Lord Jesus, not, a, not as a, a person who died on the cross, but now who is at the right hand of God, a conquering king, and he's a ruling judge, and he's almighty God, as we see him as such each day freshly, and see him and hear his voice, not hardening our hearts, but seeing him and hearing him, we can always every day repent. God, I know there are many sins in my life, but 
if you reveal this to me right now, if you're telling me this, I will repent. I will change. As we live this life out, not only individually, but as a church, the Bible says that we will enjoy the fruit of life. And where there was no little or little or no growth, spiritually, there will be growth. Where there was little uh, uh, flower and fruit, there will be much fruit from, of life. And we'll see spiritual birth uh, through you and through our church. And this is the promise of God, not only in the first century, but even today, who Jesus, who is sitting at the right hand of God and watching us and present with us. He is praising us and he is also rebuking us, supporting us, so that we can live out the healthy church life that he has called us to live. So brothers, well, let us commit to seeing him and hearing him freshly every day, even if it's uncomfortable. If he even says something that's rebuking of our, uh, something in our pattern in our life, in our church life, let us humble our hearts and let him speak to us and we will bear much fruit as he expects us to bear. So let's pray at this time. So we go to our Lord.